thanks for thanks for joining us today uh, for the first installment of the webinar series Youth Inclusion in Africa. And I'm sure everyone got the chance to hopefully to look at the webinar invite. Um, but if you didn't, uh, the first webinar that we co-hosted was uh, CRIPS, the Centre for Human Rights and Policy Studies based in Kenya. Um, the first webinar that we hosted together was back in October of, of last year. And the focus of that webinar was on, on youth inclusion and, and COVID and just exploring some of the different ways that young people have been affected by the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And the project that we are working on together is looking at youth social and economic inclusion in South, Southern and East Africa. And obviously with, with COVID, uh, that's having a great effect, uh, not just on youth inclusion, uh, but on, on greater national development strategies as well. And so th that was kind of the stimulus for, for this webinar today is to say, you know, more than a year and a half later, the pandemic is still still with us. And yeah, how, how do we see young people being affected? What are some of the new insights that we might have seen? And uh, hopefully through a discussion, we can, can hear from attendees as well. And the second part of the webinar series, which will be happening next week, Wednesday, the 15th of September, is looking at youth activism in, in Africa. And that, that includes, again, an element of uh, youth activism during COVID, uh, but also looking at broader civil, civil society in Africa as well, and trying to share some inf insights um, from some CSVR research uh, that was put together uh, in 2019. And the third webinar is focusing on youth and national development and asking some questions around youth development strategies. But maybe to, to just get started for, for this webinar, we have three presentations today. And if I can quickly just jump to the, the invite, the first presentation that we are gonna have is from Professor Malusi Langa. And Malusi, as, as some of you all know, has, has been a long, long time staff member um, at, at CSVR, I think it uh, might be 15 years or more, and uh, has been a great asset, uh, not just to the research team, but Melusi was also involved in, in counseling or the clinical team um, at, at CSVR. Um, but Melusi is also um, published a great, a great deal on issues or topics of, of masculinity, and is also uh, authored a, a book um, which was released a couple of years ago, uh, which has also received a good amount of attention looking at uh, masculinities of young black men in Alexandra Township. And maybe just before, before Malusi gets uh, ready, uh, Malusi, will you be able to share your presentation on your side or do you like me to do that? Uh, Steve, let, let, let me try because I had to move and I hope I'm visible enough, you know, because earlier on when we we're trying to connect, I was not able to connect. Uh, I can try and share on my side, um, but it says host disabled participant screen, like, you know, sharing. I, I tried to. Okay, uh, let's try to change that. You can try now. Uh, okay. There we go. Melissa, you're welcome to, to get us going and, and thanks for being with us today. Um, thanks, thanks very much, uh, uh, Stephen and, and, and fellow colleagues for, for the opportunity also, I guess, to, to speak at this, at this um, like, you know, forum. Um, I'm not sure if you can all if you can all see see my screen. It looks good, yes. Okay. Um and 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 thanks. So I'm not going to waste like you know any any time. 
and I'll quickly move into 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 my uh, presentation. And I think an introduction has been made uh, that I'm an associate senior researcher at the Center for for Study of Violence and and Reconciliation, and and obviously I guess it's a, it's an honor for me uh, to have received uh, this like you know, invitation. So my my presentation is quite is quite brief, uh, and as you can see in the title, uh, it says. Uh, COVID-19 violent policing of like, you know, uh, like you know, black men. And, and in this uh, presentation, I make um, an, an argument uh, about how, I guess like you know, different uh, states uh, worldwide have sort of like you know, responded to like you know, COVID-19. COVID, but in my introduction, uh, I, I make a very bold, you know, sort of like a you know, statement, you know, to say in response to like, you know, uh, COVID-19, COVID um, many countries uh, worldwide uh, introduced uh, lockdown regulations and curfews to spread, I mean, to keep the spread of the virus. And law enforcement officials were were relied relied upon uh, by various like you know states to enforce like you know these rules or regulations or COVID uh, uh, nineteen lockdown like you no know, regulations. So it is it is the argument that I'm going to make in this like you no know, presentation, you know, to say the the expectation of various like you no know, states. Uh, to rely on law enforcement like you know, officials created a recipe for police and law enforcement officials to abuse and harass and kill individuals who are perceived uh, to be violating uh, lockdown like you know, regulations. And, and obviously before I get into sort of like a you know, few few examples that I uh, sort of like you know, provide in the in the presentation. I, 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 I wish to spend at least maybe three to like you know, five minutes uh, sharing my theoretical sort of like understanding where I talk about the conception of the state and, and, and where I, I guess the conclusion that I sort of like you know, reach is that even prior like you no know, COVID like you no know, 19, uh, the, the state is, 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 is very like you no know, violent. And here I use the work of like you no know, Max like you no know, Weber, uh, in 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 making sense of, you know what is what is the state, and and conceptually obviously Max Weber, uh, makes like an argument that the state has always been like you no know, violent, and it is through state uh, violence uh, that. The, the 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 police obviously uh, get get used by by the state to uh, perpetrate like no violence and and obviously here max max weber makes a very compelling like you know, argument that there's a there's a strong relationship uh, between the state and violence so so obviously in his work uh, he says uh, violence cannot Cannot be divorced, like you know, from 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 the state, and obviously when you read his work, like you know, very well, uh, when he talks about like you know, violence, and and I think even uh, Salvo uh, Jejek, you know, takes this argument like you no know, further, that immediately when you talk about like you no know, violence, obviously people often think about the violence that we're able to sort of like you no know, see, and 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 Salvo Jejek, you know, makes like an argument about. The violence that is invincible, but obviously this 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 violence more often it is seen as, as legal, it is seen as constitutional, uh, it is seen as democratic, uh, and 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 this violence I mean often uh, gets gets missed in in the analysis that we often uh, sort of like you no know, do in in trying to make like you no know, sense of what is what is violence, because often the violence that we talk about. It, it, it is the one that is public, it is the one that is visible, 
it is the one that is uh, sort of like no physical, like you no know, in nature. So obviously, given the, the the intimate relationship between the state and violence, uh, he he then assesses that the state relies on all kinds of like you no know, laws uh, to claim the monopoly uh, on the use of of legitimate like you no know, force, and obviously where it's like. Uh, when you look at lockdown, like you no know, regulations, which I guess is the conclusion that I sort of like you no know, uh, reaches that. I mean, we we have made regulations, and obviously, given the regulations that we have made, we we can now claim the monopoly uh, in enforcing uh, this like you no know, uh, regulations. So violence, in in a way, uh, becomes embedded within within the state. And obviously, some some forms of like no violence, like I said earlier on, are, are public in nature, while others are symbolic. But the symbolic like no forms of violence are the one uh, are the ones that uh, are not often sort of like no analyzed when we when we talk about uh, violence that the state sort of like no uh, 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 perpetrates. So obviously, here I I then sort of like no argue, you know, to say. Uh, Law enforcement agencies are therefore, you know, given a Weberian uh, sort of like an understanding of the state, are therefore used as key actors to legitimate uh, uh, the the use of the use of like no force. So the use of force, and and you see it throughout throughout the world, you know that in in response to lockdown like no regulations, we we have seen a protest, protest in different sort of like you know, countries where, where people were protesting against some of the lockdown like you know, regulations with an argument that some obviously violated their constitutional rights or their de democratic like you no know, rights. And obviously in response to many of this like you no know, protest, uh, the state relied on law enforcement like you no know, agencies to even disperse uh, some of those like you no know, protest, and in some cases, obviously, protest leaders or protesters uh, were 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 arrested. So the use of force, uh, we, which goes beyond like you no know, COVID like you no know, nineteen, it is often viewed as the core form of like you no know, policing. So with the protests that we have seen uh, after the killing of uh, George Floyd. Uh, uh, where, where obviously, I mean, there were worldwide like you no know, protest, uh, and 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 obviously, in in this like you no know, presentation later, I I I focus on on some of the examples of what happened in Kenya, some of the examples that have happened in in South Africa, and when you read about the 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 violent sort of like you no know, policing of 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 young men, I guess like you no know, prior. Uh, uh, COVID like you no know, 19 and during COVID 19, you you see the continuities of 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 how uh, spaces were like you no know, policed I guess like you no know, prior like you no know, COVID like you no know, 19. So, so obviously here the the argument that I sort of like you no know, make is that the relationship between state violence and policing uh, go hand in 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 hand. You know the two cannot cannot be sort of like you no know, separated. So obviously now, if we give a sort of like you no know, practical like you know, examples, is that the state uh, does not police its citizens in the same way, okay? So obviously here is the policing of the of the underclass, the policing of the proletariat, the policing of people on the margins, or the policing of the poor sort of like you no know, working class, and and here I also rely on the work of like you no know, James Holston. Where, where in his like no work, he talks about how citizens on the margins are often seen as 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 trouble sort of like no makers, as as people that are violent, as as people that defy a sort of like no legal like no systems, and as a result of how they are sort of like no conceptualized and sort of like no seen, uh, they are seen as 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 deserving uh, to be to be policed. Uh, sort of like no violently. So, so, so obviously here, if we're to pause a bit in, in this like no argument, you know, to say the state does not police its citizens in the same way. 
and 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 obviously when you when you look at the reports by human rights like you know in Kenya and you look at the reports of like you no know, IPID in in South Africa again prior like you know uh covid like you no know, 19 you you see some of this like you no know, patterns on how a uh, young 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 black men especially young black men are being policed in in certain sort of like you no know, spaces uh, be in the Cape Flats, uh, be in Alexandra, be in Tembisa, uh, be in the in the inner city. Uh, they get they get policed differently, as compared to uh, uh, how suburban areas are being sort of like no police. So here I give like an example to say: Do police in Kenya police uh, police people in Mutare or Gibera? In the same way as the police uh, citizens in 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 your suburban areas such as Karen and Lavington or or Runda, and and the same sort of like you know, applies in in South Africa. You know, to say, uh, do police in South Africa police residents in Alexandra in the same way as the police uh, residents in 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 Santin? And obviously, the the answer is definitely sort of like you no know, no, uh, because Law enforcement officials uh, use all kinds of like you no know, markers in their policing. Uh, some of the markers, obviously, they include gender, they include race, they include class, they include uh, religious beliefs, and 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 even like you no know, ethnicity in the policing of like you no know, citizens. Uh, so 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 obviously here, if if you look at the, the the media reports and obviously here i relied only on sort of like you know, two countries but worldwide we 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 we, we know that there have been a lot of like you no know, reports on police brutality in response to like you no know, covid 19 especially where the state felt that people were not obeying a uh, lockdown sort of like you no know, regulations and obviously here, despite all the criticisms about its effectiveness, and especially when you, re you read uh, human rights like no watch, like no reports in Kenya, that the independent, which is like maybe independent, inverted like no commas, uh, independent police, like no oversight authority, like no in Kenya, for an example, has reported 15 deaths uh, immediately, I guess, like no few days uh, after uh, the lockdown uh, regulations were sort of like you know, announced uh, due to police like you no know, brutality, and obviously this was like within a short period of time, over a period of like you know uh, two to sort of like you no know, three months, and 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 obviously I mean though here this this figure that I'm um, sort of like you no know, putting to the fore, we 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 got this information from the independent and a lot of questions. I mean to say. Obviously, this body uh, similar to what is happening in South Africa, you know, to say in terms of police brutality or cases of like no murder, uh, we we rely on IPID and the independence of IPID has always been like no questioned. And again, in in Kenya, you 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 see the same sort of like no concern. But when you look at the number, obviously, I mean, this number is like no quite like you know uh, very very high. And the 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 all kinds of like no incidences that were sort of like no reported, and and obviously I mean some that I sort of like no give in the presentation, uh, the killing of the two the two brothers were sort of like no university, like you know students in Kenya, and then after they were sort of like no killed, police came out, you know to then claim you know to say no these two young men. Uh, they 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 were arrested and they were put in a police van, and when they were driven to the police station, uh, they tried to run. I mean, tried to jump out of a moving uh, police vehicle, and as a result, they sustained injuries, and then they were kept in the cells, and they died. Then, as a result, as a result of that, and and then obviously the killing of a 13-year-old, uh, Hussein Moyo was shot with live ammunition while sitting at the balcony with sort of like you know, uh, his, 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 his parents. And obviously also this incident created a public like you know, fure. And it was quite interesting when, when you read on how uh, the, the president also responded 
you know, to some of these like you know incidents. And and when you read between the lines, is that in, in fact there was no uh, sort of like you no know, public condemn, condemnation that obviously uh, police were were not supposed to have acted the manner in which they sort of like you no know, acted. And again in in. We, we have seen sort of like no similar uh, when young black men uh, with, 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 with lockdown like no regulations. And obviously here I give a uh, head of uh, the killing of and the killing of uh, Mr. Miguel's and many other like you know, young, like you know, black men were killed, you know, during this uh, sort of like you no know, period. And when you compare what happened in Kenya, it is as if police uh, uh, in, in South Africa were, were, were sharing notes, were reading the same sort of like you know, scripts. But then when you go back to the introduction that I gave about the intimate relationship with, between uh, the state and how the state often uses violence in 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 i i i guess in policing uh, its citizens then these two examples are not very sort of like you know uh surprising but again if one was to then do another form of like you no know, analysis that when you look at how often young black men because it is quite interesting that throughout the world when you compare how many uh, women die in the hands of like you no know, uh, police officials? I'm not saying uh, women do not die in the hands of like you no know, uh, police like you no know, officers, but you do a comparison of like you no know, how many young black men die in the hands of like you no know, uh, police like you no know, officers. It, it it is it is it is quite like you no know, high to say young men and then you put race young black men are more likely to die in the hands of like you no know, police like you no know, officers. And then you do the analysis of that. So obviously here, I make like an argument to say young black men are often at a risk of police brutality and violence and often based on the stereotype of how they are sort of like not seen and, and depicted and depicted as unruly and defiant and violent and aggressive. And based on some of these like no stereotypes uh, and, 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 and police often use uh, violent means in, in policing uh, young like no black men but also one can go far as looking at how uh, police officers construct like no their role and I argue you know to say they they draw on the social construct of hegemonic like no masculinities in which I guess like no victims of uh, police like no violence are positioned as villains while law enforcement officials po position themselves as, as, as people that are there to enforce like you know uh, laws and and, 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 and and as a result of seeing themselves as people that enforce uh, rules and regulations, they see themselves as performing heroic like you no know, roles. So obviously the use of like you no know, violence affirms and obviously I mean if I had more time, I'll sort of like you no know, use some of the examples you know to say, their use of like no violence affirms law enforcement officials a sense of like no manhood while undermining and shaming and marginalizing uh, whoever is a victim of like no violence like no sense of like no manhood so obviously then i argue you know to say this this violence if you analyze it from a gender sort of like no point of view you see what we call male to male uh, uh, sort of like no uh, like no violence but also the lockdown uh, regulations gave law enforcement, like in officials, an additional power and authority. And, and I sort of like you know, argue, bolstered by the, 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 the panic and fear associated with the risk of like you know, contracting like you know, COVID-19 like, you know, to further criminalize like you know, young, like you know, black men. So obviously when you look at this is that Policing is not just a safety like no act, but it's also like a gendered like you no know, uh, phenomenon, 
uh, which draws on other discourses of race, class, in justifying like you no know, certain acts of like you no know, violence against like you no know, poor and black uh, working class like you no know, men. So when you look at the the violence that you have seen during like you no know, uh, lockdown, I've already made this 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 point that it was mainly perpetrated uh, by like you no know, police like you no know, officers, and and obviously in 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 South Africa, uh, I mean I, I I wrote a paper where. I, I analyze uh, some of these like you know, cases where the argument that I make is like this way, where it was uh, black on black, uh, sort of like you no know, violence. And obviously it, it differs with what we have seen in the US where the, the officers, of course, in terms of race were sort of like you no know, white and, and, and often the victims are like you no know, black. And, and, and obviously, I mean, there's a lot that can be said about uh, the, the, the intricacies of class and race in, in, in making sense of like no police, uh, sort of like no violence. But the simple conclusion that I sort of like no reach is that uh, policing general is, 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 is very like no violent, but, but it's, 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 a violent, it's a violence that is sort of like no legalized. And it is it's the violence that is monopolized by the state. It is the violence that o o obviously it is seen as sort of like no legal. And, and, and then one can even go far as what is often referred as the police like no culture. And one may even go before one becomes like a police like no officer, you know, to say, how do police officers uh, get, get trained? And obviously their training often, I argue in some of like no my work, you know, to say it is very like no violent, it is very masculine, uh, sort of like you no know, in nature. So obviously the only way, you know, to deal with like you no know, police, like you no know, violence, you know, because this this violence, like I've said in my in, in this like you no know, presentation, it, it cannot only be limited to the COVID-19 uh, sort of like you no know, period. What COVID-19 did, it then amplified uh, police like you no know, brutality, it amplified police like you no know, violence, it made it more uh, sort of like no public. So, so obviously the long-term uh, um, strategy or sort of like no uh, prevention is to make sure that we begin to uh, inculcate a different uh, policing culture, a culture that is, that is policing that is non-violent, non policing that is non-sexist, policing that is non-racist, policing that is non-sort of like no homophobic. And obviously this, this form of like no policing uh, need to be uh, promoted uh, beyond like you know, COVID-19. Like, you know, but obviously, like I said, COVID-19 made this problem uh, more uh, sort of like you no know, public. And I think maybe I'll want to end my presentation here. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Melissi. Thanks, thanks for that presentation. and. Um, I definitely I hope that um, the attendees and panelists will also um, share some of their thoughts via the question and answer function on, on Zoom. Uh, but after the three presentations or two remaining presentations, we hope to have uh, a discussion, um, a broader discussion where we can discuss um, Melissi's presentation further. Uh, but thank you very much, Melissi. Uh, the next presentation that, that we have is by Rosita Katsande. And Rosita is the director of the Youth Empowerment and Transformation Trust uh, based in Zimbabwe. And uh, the acronym is YET. YET is a network-based youth advocacy CSO in Zimbabwe. Rosita is a gender and socioeconomic justice activist who has worked in the field of youth development, democracy and governance in Zimbabwe for over 10 years. She is a highly motivated leader with a passion for innovation and excellence. Rosita is the coordinator for the RDLC funded project, which is titled Strengthening Constructive and Active Youth Engagement in Civic Processes in Zimbabwe. Rosita, uh, over to you. If you've got a presentation, we can just help you make sure that it gets put up. Um, thank you. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'll just speak to uh, the points that I've um, put down. Um, I'm very excited to be participating in this um, uh, webinar. 
uh, and I look forward to learn um, from um, the other panelists and also participants to this webinar. So as been highlighted by Steve, um, as yet we are carrying out um, a research on strengthening constructive and uh, active youth engagement in civic processes. And we, have start, we started um, uh, conducting this research in 2018. And I'm also, you know, for me, it's also interesting to also give the analysis in terms of how the COVID-19 pandemic period has excluded youth from democratic uh, participation. Um, so maybe to start off and indicate uh, that uh, when you talk of uh, youth exclusion um, in, in democratic participation in Zimbabwe, this is a challenge that we had before COVID-19. And I would want to ask it that with the coming in of COVID-19, uh, the lockdown restrictions, it then worsened uh, the situation. And um, in Zimbabwe, the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns, they continue being a challenge that young people face uh, today. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how young people were excluded from democratic participation in, during COVID-19, the effects uh, of that exclusion and possibly proper recommendations in terms of what there needs to be done to ensure that there is more youth inclusion and involvement in democratic um, uh, processes. Um, so I would want to um, argue that um, the COVID-19 resulted in the exclusion of young people in democratic uh, processes um, during the COVID-19 uh, period because uh, firstly, uh, we, through our research, we noted that um, there is lack of access to information about laws and legal restrictions, especially pertaining to COVID-19. Um, and in the case of Zimbabwe, we also had um, the government making you know, a lot of amendments in with regards to the statutory instrument. So the feedback or the findings from the research is that a lot of young people, they lack such as information in terms of the laws and the legal restrictions when it comes to COVID-19 uh, lockdowns. So what that then um, leads to is a situation where a lot of young people are then arrested um, or their rights are violated because they are not aware of these policy uh, provisions um, with regards to COVID-19. And uh, secondly, young people were excluded from democratic participation during the COVID-19 um, period because um, the lockdowns that were enforced limited mobility for, for young people to move from one point to another. And then on the other level, we have youth organizations, youth groups who ordinarily reach out to young people with information, do programming, face-to-face -face meetings. But because of the lockdown restrictions, these were not possible. So what it meant is that there was then a gap where young people were not able to organize, to convene spaces and be able to push for issues that affect them and also their communities. So, and I think what is also worrying in our context has also been the selective application of the law where you know, certain sections of the country are not allowed to convene, but we also saw some political parties uh, going ahead with their public gatherings. So what it means at the end of the day, the platforms that are available for youth to organize and participate through the groups limits their democratic participation. Um, then we also have a challenge where, because of the current COVID-19 um, regulations, we have our by-elections um, uh, suspended by the government. Uh, it's also worrying because we have quite a number of parliamentary constituencies, councils that have a lot of vacancies. And this has, um, affected in terms of representative uh, democracy. So we still we are still getting the narrative that um, we are not we've put it, um, we've suspended the holding of elections because we have these public health regulations. And once 
um, the regulations are lifted, that's when we can get elections. And for me, it's also worrying because one of the ways in which young people participate in democratic processes is through, uh, through elections. We've seen other countries, they've also managed to conduct elections successfully, despite them having COVID-19 um, within their, their, their countries. Um, then I think the other issue, uh, which is key, is the loss of income um, that comes uh, from the lockdown restrictions. According to the research that we conducted, we noted that 38% um, uh, of the young people that we reached out, they reported a loss of income, 26% lost savings, some lost profits, which is 17%, uh, loss of employment, 14%. Um, so what that shows you is that um, the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, further worsened the economic situation of young people where in an economy where we have high levels of, 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 of unemployment. So uh, it then um, brings out questions it then to say, how then uh, do you ensure that young people are involved in such a, a situation? Uh, we also noted that the COVID-19 um, lockdown also had social impacts uh, on the part of young people, for example, um, reduction in education quality because students are no longer able to go to school. They have to resort to online, online learning, which is in most cases a challenge for these, some of the young people because they don't have that access to data. So it then means it limits their right to, to education. We also had other health related impacts, including uh, inadequate food for the households, loss of productivity due to COVID-19 sickness um, within their, the, 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 their communities. So these are some of the challenges uh, and also effects of the COVID-19 when it comes to youth exclusion. Um, and I also want to highlight that um, how have, you know, these young people, they have also expressed their feelings uh, of despair, and are questioning whether they are going to be able uh, to um, access available opportunities and also question around if they are also going to get a chance to be included in key sectors in their lifetime. And um, the frustration uh, has also been seen with some young people resorting to violence. We've also seen other illegal social mal malices happening such as drug, um, and substance abuse uh, because young people are frustrated and they use those as alternatives um, because they are lying, lying, they are lying idle and not doing anything. So in light of the, the above challenges and the effects of uh, exclusion, which it means at the end of the day, the youth voice, the youth issues are not taken into consideration. What we need to work more on is to ensure that we have um, gender and disability inclusive youth oriented interventions so that we leave no one behind uh, is uh, we do work on youth participation in uh, democratic participation. And I think it's also important that we redefine the position of young people as full citizens um, so that we focus more on inclusion, respect of their perspectives and choices. Um, in spite of the constrained situation, we need to see what contribution youth uh, need to start making. Um, so it's important that we have young people being key actors in the civil and political transformation of the country. Um, we also realize that uh, because of COVID-19 and also the limited um, options in terms of reaching out to these young people, you know, they, uh, we resorted to virtual programming or to do our meetings, engagement with duty bearers through virtual means, but that is also created a gap in terms of ensuring that we are inclusive as we do uh, our work. And based on this, I, there is a solid case for ensuring that the ex expanded civic engagement through formal and um, informal spaces. We need to consider alternative ways of engaging young people so that we ensure that they have a long-term framework for youth engagement uh, within their communities. 
But what is also key is also then to ensure that um, we have young people leading the COVID-19 responses, um, even at community and national level, they also will then help to ensure that whatever mechanisms are going to be put in place, they are youth-centered, and they also respond to the needs and aspirations uh, of, 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 of young people. Um, so maybe to summarize, um, we need to then see how we can also ensure that we work towards youth meaningful engagement um, in this COVID-19 situation. And indications are that we still have COVID with us and we may need to see how do we adapt to the situation so that we have young people that can play a key, key, key role um, around this. So thank you very much. I'll stop here and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Rosita. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. And I think there are many, many great points that uh, I hope we can pick up on um, in the, the broader discussion section. Um, the last presentation is, is by myself. And I actually just need to try and find it. Uh, what I guess what I'm going to have to do is just um, try and share my entire screen. Um, Matesh, are you there? Cool, I'm sure everyone hopefully can see my desktop. Hopefully my fellow panelists can, can let me know if there's any issue. Um, Melissa Rosita, can you guys see my screen? Okay, I hope, I hope we're doing all right. So I'll, I'll keep watching the, the chats and uh, yes, we can, everyone can see me. Okay, cool. So th this presentation that, uh, that I'm sharing here is so kind of looking at what, what I think is a bit of a double bound. Um, you know, in research, a double blind is, is kind of, you know, when 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 there are double two two layers of kind of not really being aware of you know who's been allocated to to different groups and and just this the sense of kind of being uh, excluded and not fully aware of of what's happening and I think um, that that kind of links to the different narratives uh, the layers of narratives that we see are around young people and especially now um, young people in South Africa during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And this, this kind of presentation is also developing from a project that we are doing with, with Crips. And the project is titled Youth Inclusion in Socioeconomic and Livelihood Programs, Potential for Fostering Social Cohesion and Violence Prevention in Southern and East Africa. And one aspect of this uh, research or this project was a regional review of literature, policies and programs related to youth social and economic inclusion. And one of the themes that, that came up in, in the review is really around different narratives or discourses around, around youth and how these discourses are likely to influence youth inclusion in policy, in programming, and how it's likely to influence the different areas of our people's lives. Uh, I guess we, we see different types of narratives. Some are well, generally the pathologizing or problematizing narratives of young people. I think kind of like uh, Rosita mentioned, uh, this the sense of young people kind of being idle or the sense of young people being, especially young men being, being troublesome, um, you know, waiting for government to, to give them handouts. Uh, another narrative is youth as, as the future uh, and youth as, as kind of the saviors. And another one, I, th I think hopefully a more balanced narrative is recognizing youth resilience, uh, trying to counter that problematizing narrative um, that's out there. And obviously, this project has been happening during the COVID pandemic. And when the project started in, uh, I think it was October 2018, 
uh, COVID-19 was something no one ever imagined. And, and so the pandemic in itself, I guess, has influenced research and programs, policies, you know, so many aspects of, of life. So I think uh, if we look at the media, uh, it's just one of the areas where we can try and see some of the narratives of, of young people during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the one, one kind of narrative that we get is the sense of youth being irresponsible, uh, youth are contagious, or youth or young people are the super spreaders of the COVID-19 pandemic in South Africa. And we can, we can see that most especially during South Africa's second COVID wave or spike, which happened to, towards the end of last year. And um, as you can see from the title of, of this article, um, there's this the sense that young people need to be reprimanded um, you know, for, for being party animals or for you know, young people need to be reminded um, of, of the risks uh, associated with, with COVID. And this was linked to the end of, um, obviously, for a lot of young people, matric, um, you know, completing matric exams, the, the rite of passage of either going on matric vac um, vacations or, you know, that December period being this time of, of celebration. And obviously during COVID, that, that was a bit complicated, but there were a lot of big events for um, matriculants and I guess open to many people of different ages. And, you know, these events kind of rocked um, many, many people and especially the government who were like, no, you can't have these, you can't have these events, we need, we need to shut this down. Young people are not wearing masks, there's no restrictions in place. And, you know, we're just seeing this um, virus being spread. You know, and young people are the ones who are, are kind of spreading this. But I think the reality is that, you know, it's not just young people who are, are spreading or contracting COVID. The reality is people of all ages, races, genders, cultures, religions, I think we're all equally at risk of, of, of spreading this, this virus. And I guess that was shown, um, you know, by the KZN Minister of, of Health, who, who's not a young person. She is not a young person. And technically, she, if we're talking about responsibility, uh, because young people are framed as not being responsible, um, we would assume that as a Minister of Health, she, she would be taking COVID seriously or, you know, setting this example. And I guess that's why it made the headlines. And, and here she's, she's pictured without a mask, um, you know, at a, a birthday celebration. And, you know, just a, a good example, um, you know, of us, not just young people who, who are, you know, wanting to just continue with life and, and potentially making these decisions around how they want to respond to, to the pandemic. And even for myself, um, it's not often that I get out during the pandemic, but on the occasions where I have got out, you can see, you know, members of your own family, um, extended family and friends who, you know, the first opportunity to take off a mask, there we go, the mask is off, you know. And um, so I think we really need to challenge this idea that it's just young people who are spreading this, um, people of all ages um, who are attending birthdays and funerals, um, you know, and but this is generally the sense that it's just young people who, who are spreading this virus. And I think what a lot of these narratives also don't tell us is, you know, how young people are actually being affected by, by the virus. Um, we, if you look at a lot of reports by different uh, in, international and regional bodies, you know, we see that young people are, are being seriously affected in, in the different areas of their lives. And when it comes to job losses, uh, young people work in the sectors of the economy that are most likely to be affected by economic shocks. Um, so job losses, young people have been most affected by, by job losses and unemployment and loss of income. And all of this research also shows especially how young women and women more generally are, are kind of worst affected um, by the COVID pandemic uh, in terms of their income, but in other areas of their lives as well. 
for me, what was been quite interesting is we, we move between the sense of, of COVID being unmanageable and not seeing an end in sight and the vac South African vaccination campaign um, starting to kick in. And in South Africa, this commenced in, in early 2021. And the, the campaign was then open to um, South African ID holders, which includes obviously citizens and permanent residents uh, over the age of 65. That was opened up in, in May of 2021. Uh, for over 50s, uh, that was in July of this year. And we know that there have been various issues that have hampered the rollout of, um, the, vac of the vaccination campaign. And um, that includes things like the, the electronic vaccination data system. Uh, obviously, people from, from different areas, from different age groups, um, have different levels of access to the system. And, um, you know, a lot of people mentioned how it's obviously not easy for older people uh, to be able to access this electronic system. Um, but like, likewise, even for young people, uh, electronic system still has um, its limitations. But what we've also been seeing in our vaccination campaign is there have been low vaccination rates. And again, it might not just be because of vaccination hesitancy or you know, people's personal choices, there are other factors that we need to consider. Um, but because of these low vaccination rates, the uh, vaccination program was open to young people a lot earlier than, than expected. And uh, for us in South Africa, we have been able to see um, some of the most recent uh, statistics. And I mean, this is from, from yesterday, the most updated stats. Um, we can see, based on those who have had the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine and, and those who have had the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine, that all in all, it looks like there's just, just over 7 million South Africans who have received the full Johnson vaccine or, you know, both doses of the the Pfizer vaccine. So I guess we, we're just hovering above 10% uh, of the South African population. In terms of the adult population, I guess that's obviously uh, higher than 10%. Uh, we can also see when considering the different factors that affect um, uptake, um, we can look across provinces that there have been different levels of or numbers of people that have been vaccinated. And obviously spatial aspects, um, you know, South Africa's history, these are all factors that influence how easy it is for people to, to access the vaccine. Uh, in, this in this graph, we can, can see an age and uh, sex disaggregated um, look at the vaccinations. And you can see uh, that people 50 years or 60 years and older, they, there was a good amount of um, people 60 years and older who have been vaccinated. We see some, some skew in terms of gender where 23 or 24% of uh, women above the age of 60 received the vaccine compared to 15% of men over the age of 60. Um, in the ages of 50 to 59, we can see that that portion is, is quite small for both men and women. Uh, for people aged 35 to 49, um, there is still a bit of a gender skew, but again, the numbers aren't, aren't very high. The vaccinations only open to young people, I think it was in the last week of August. So in the space of a couple of weeks, so we can see that about 5% of, pardon me, let me try to go back, 5% of young men have received the vaccine and close to 7% of young women have, have received the vaccine. And again, that's just showing uh, statistics across the provinces. Um, you know, we need to, to be aware of, you know, the different aspects that affect people's access to the vaccine. But for me, I was, I was quite interested to see how the narratives seem to, to change. And, um, you know, narratives of how young people are potentially spreading this virus and, you know, need to um, potentially put restrictions in place that will likely, you know, plan to affect 
lack of young people, there's, there's now this, a different type of, of narrative. And, and this narrative is more around how young people are potentially the saviors. And um, President Soram Poza actually put together a letter uh, around the 23rd of, of August or so, um, just kind of reinforcing this idea of how you know, young people are resilient, young people are doing um, you know, great jobs in their communities, they've been actively involved, and you know, young people are the shining light um, to, to all other South Africans. You know? And I think it's because well, again, hopefully we can can discuss this, but it's likely because um, of the low vaccination rates amongst other age groups, and this the sense of you know the outcome of this pandemic rests quite squarely on the up uptake of the vaccine amongst amongst young people. So for me, this this has been quite an interesting shift to to kind of note there. I think. In some of my concluding thoughts or, or remarks, uh, for me, obviously, in looking for examples of narratives, um, you know, searching uh, the internet, looking across the media, there's not as many examples as, as we'd expect. But I guess that doesn't mean that these narratives aren't pervasive. It doesn't mean that these narratives uh, are all around us. Um, you know, sometimes these, these narratives can be found in, in different spaces and these narratives, we can see them internalized in ourselves. I, for myself, will admit probably before working on this project, uh, I was, was someone who probably held that same idea that, you know, it's young people who are spreading this, this virus, but I hope that through the program, I've become more aware of, of how, you know, we can't continue with these pathologizing views of young people. And the reality is um, my own uh, uncles and aunts in their 50s and 60s are, are kind of having very risky types of behaviors. Um, I think when it comes to the, the shift that we noted uh, around young people and, and, and vaccinations, you know, I guess we can see that in different ways. And sometimes we could say, well, is this another example of, of youth exp exploitation? Um, we know that come the, election time, uh, a lot of politicians will, will, will kind of focus their attention on young people. Um, you know, is, is this a moment kind of showing again how now you, we, we need young people now all of a sudden? Um, you know, we really, a lot is riding on them and we need to try and motivate young people. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's problematic maybe to just see it in that way because a lot of people have been mentioning how um, President Ramaphosa has been taking these issues uh, and youth inclusion uh, quite seriously. And I think at the same time, even though he is taking it seriously, we, we need to still question um, you know, some of the, the comments that he's made when, when the president is saying that young people uh, are playing an integral part of this national efforts to battle this, this virus. We need to kind of really think about the, the overall uh, approach that we've had to, to the pandemic. And the reality is the, the government's approach has been very exclusionary. It has been quite patronizing, um, you know, that um, generally young people and people of all ages, uh, we need to be told what to do. We, we don't know what it's in our best interest. We don't act in, in our own best interest. And so government needs to take on that parental role and, and kind of really either tell us or force us um, to, to do things we don't want to do. And the last point, unfortunately, I can't see it on my screen, is I think it's important for us to, to challenge these narratives in different spaces. Um, we, we know that they're there and it would be interesting to see from, from Rosita and um, attendees from different countries is, you know, what are some of the narratives you might have seen of young people during COVID uh, in your countries, um, you know, in our in our personal spaces, we can try and challenge these narratives. And you know, I find myself trying to do that in conversations with with family through our work. We we get to do the same thing. And I guess so in the media when we when we see these types of narratives, um, hopefully we can put together you know statements or our own opinion pieces to try and and share 
and try question and challenge the narratives that we that we see. Let me stop screen sharing on my side. And that is our three presentations for for today. And I wanted to ask attendees if you can, you know, please feel free to uh, add your questions and comments uh, via the Q&A function, or please raise your hand and we'll allow you to, um, to contribute to, to the discussion. Um, we do already have, have one question that, that has been addressed to Melusi, but I'd also like to ask uh, Rosita if, if she could also um, potentially answer this question. Um, Dominique asked Melusi, uh, or, or say thanks so much for the presentation, Lucy. How do you feel uh, that the policing has influenced activism by youth, particularly young black men in, in South Africa, Kenya, and elsewhere? How has this been influenced, if at all, by movements such as Black Lives Matter? Do you feel that there has been an adjustment to youth activism because of COVID? Um, Lucy, uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Steve. I mean, look, there, there is no way we can contest the view that uh, the the movement uh, in in the US has had like a huge, 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 huge impact. I mean, um, when when the movement was taking place uh, in the in the US. I, I I remember in, in South Africa there was there was a very strong like no response, you know to say uh, Collins Koza uh, life does sort of like no matter, and in fact during during that that period, um, the, the the there was a strong uh, sort of like no view, you know to say when Cyril Ramaphosa like you know sort of like no commented. And in fact, even the ANC during that like no period uh, wrote a sort of like um, like a letter, you know, uh, sort of like you know we we in support to uh, the family of uh, George Floyd, and and I remember in the media uh, there, there was a there was a very strong uh, sort of like no response, you know, to say and and a lot of names were sort of like no put to the fore. And of course, some went far as like, you know, what about the, and, and, and obviously we had this conversation as, as CSVR, like you know, uh, last week uh, with the situation in, in, in Marikana, you know, to say, what about the mine workers in Marikana? And, and a lot of names were sort of like put to the fore. So, so obviously I sort of like you know, agree with the question, you know, to say uh, the Black Lives Matter has, has really had a huge, huge like you no know, impact and 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 even in Kenya, when the two uh, brothers were 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 sort of like you no know, killed, uh, uh, the, 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 there was also sort of like you know, a movement, you know, basically saying uh, their lives also sort of like you no know, matter. And 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 obviously, I sort of like you no know, agree, you know, to say, yeah, I mean, tying up with your presentation, you know, to say. Young people often are sort of like you no know, seen as as bystanders, as as people that just like you no know, sit and and not take up uh, sort of like you no know, spaces. But I think what we have seen with 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 COVID in in different uh, like you no know, countries uh, where, where 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 young people are are, are actively uh, despite you know uh, the the marginalize the marginalization sort of like you know, in between uh, taking up. Uh, sort of like you no know, rightful uh, uh, sort of like you no know, spaces, and and asserting you know sort of like you no know, their own views. You know to say uh, we we also do sort of like you no know, matter, and our voices uh, also matter in this sort of like you no know, that. Um, but with regards to sort of like you no know, police brutality, uh, we have seen it in 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 Nigeria. I guess even during uh, uh, the the Black Lives Matter in in the US, where there was a pushback. Uh, with with this elite uh, police like you know, unit in Nigeria, uh, where in fact it went far as where uh, the social media was sort of like you no know, deactivated. Uh, so obviously again the other point is about the use of like you no know, social media. That that obviously I mean things run quickly, 
and and obviously i mean i guess there's an activism that takes place in that like no space but also there's an activism that takes place uh in 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 different sort of like no uh like no countries um yeah thanks steve thanks a lot thanks Marisi. um rosita i wonder if you can pose the same same question to you i mean how how do you think the black lives matter movement affected um youth activism in zimbabwe and you know what do you what have you maybe also seen in terms of policing of young people um during covid um thank you uh, steve uh so for me um with uh, regards to our context um uh in zimbabwe with the black Li black lives matter I think we also noted that uh, with the COVID-19 lockdown uh, restrictions, we saw a lot of uh, young people uh, utilizing social media to access information, to discuss on issues affecting um, them uh, from political, social, and economic fronts. And we also noted that there was, um, you know, I think they, I mean, since, um, the last year, the lockdown, we've seen more young people are utilizing social media uh, in terms of mobilizing and organizing around uh, issues of um, their concern. And the Black Lives Matter was also very topical in Zimbabwe, and people even quening it, Zimbabwean Lives Matter. Uh, but I think um, what then presents as a challenge in terms of uh, then ensuring how such campaigns can then reach out to other young people who may not necessarily be on uh, social media because we do have a challenge in um, where the price of data for young people to access internet is very high. And also given their economic situation, they may not be able to um, get um, that kind of information. So we have seen them social media uh, also playing a role in terms of also the young people in the other stake, stakeholders also pushing a, a narrative uh, around their discourses. Uh, but I think we also need to see how we can also even address some of the challenges uh, to do with misinformation, disinformation, because we also have a challenge of fake news even on some of these campaigns. So at the end of the day, sometimes some of these young people are not able to really um, do a bit of research to assess to what extent the messages that they will be sharing will be accurate or not. So these are my perspectives on the question that you have raised. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Rosita. Um, on, on my end, I do uh, note at Linda's hand, we just had a, a question that, that came in before Linda raised the hand. And uh, the question is uh, from a participant who is anonymous. Um, it's addressed to myself, but I would like to open it up to everyone and to ask both panelists and attendees, um, you know, to please add, add your thoughts. Um, it says, hi everyone, and thank you for the great discussion. This is a question for Stephen. Would you say that the narratives around the youth also propel the exclusion of the youth in valuable state discourses? Um, fostering some scapegoat, scapegoat mechanism for the state's inability or reluctance to include the youth in, in prominent spaces. And I mean, obviously we can, can open this up to, to everyone else, but uh, in, in the report that, um, that CSVR put together, I was responsible for, for authoring that. Uh, I think it's, it's, that's most definitely the case is that, um, you know, we do still see um, youth being being scapegoated, you know, in South Africa, but across Southern and East Africa. And we do see how the narratives of young people, um, you know, greatly affects um, in public policies, but also, you know, state-led initiatives. And, you know, an example uh, of that could be you know, this, this, this top-down approach to, to policy and, and program development. Um, and I guess it's not just uh, in, in our state or with our government, but across the world, we can see how, um, you know, generally that, that saying that, you know, uh, wisdom comes with age, you know, that as we get older, 
we know more and that older people know more than young people just because of life experience. And, you know, that's, I think, I think that is a central narrative that drives youth exclusion. You know, that what do you know? You're young, you haven't lived, you have no idea, you're, you're naive, uh, you're ignorant, you've just finished school, you haven't even entered the real world. I mean, I've, I was told that many times throughout my life that wait until you start working one day, then you'll be in the real world. And, you know, I think young people face a lot of those same messages and those developing policies feel that they know better than, than others because they've been in government for a long time. They were part of the liberation struggle in South Africa. They, they kind of know, they understand politics better because politics is a game, um, you know, that young people don't understand. So most definitely it is something that's there. And these narratives can also be used to, to scapegoat and, and shift blame, um, to, to shift anger and resentment, um, you know, from, from government to, to another group. Um, so thanks, Anonymous, for that question. And I wanted to see, uh, I've noticed Linda's hand. If anyone else wants to answer that, um, you know, please feel free to jump in after, after Linda raises her point. Uh, Linda? Um, thank you, Steve, and thank you to all the, the, the panelists for your for your comments. I, I just wanted to share a few insights. Um, um, number one, I really appreciated Roswitha's presentation and um, what, what we appreciate in, in regards to the Black Lives Matter movement was that it just showed us the solidarity um, that is there uh, amongst young people all over the world but also it just helped us to understand the power that social media in particular and digital media in general has in ensuring that um, you know, some of these issues that are affecting youth in different parts of the world are highlighted and that the youth can come together and bring their voices, whether it be from Kenya, from South Africa, or even from the US. Um, I note also what you had mentioned in regard to how not everyone has access to, to digital media or the data that can help you to, you know, to, to, to have your voice within these spaces. And for, for Crips, what, one of the things that we saw happening on the Kenyan front when we started looking at the impact COVID-19 has on youth inclusion um, and also in programs that uh, various youth groups has was that um, in early 2020, um, while talking to some of our partners who work on research in countering violent extremism, we noted that, for instance, um, community-based organizations were integrating COVID-19 awareness into their programs using um, things such as theater, um, you know, community theater, using the community radio programs, um, you know, to share information that was that was really um, pertinent in terms of, you know, simple things like washing your hands and wearing a mask, which we have seen goes a long way in preventing the, the spread of COVID-19. And then as we as we move now into 2021, we've also seen um, how organizations um, are doing very important work in um, in the grassroots or rather in low income areas, encouraging participation in getting tested, ensuring that you know there's access to healthcare and education. And a lot of a survey showed that a lot of the people who are doing some of this uh, work, especially um, on the front lines of, of COVID response in areas like Kibera, were the youth, you know, and so then it shows you that the youth have a really big role to play in terms of not only ensuring that there's awareness on COVID-19, but also um, what are some of the things that they can do to ensure that um, the spread is stemmed. And I also appreciate that as of as of two as of um, July, um, uh, vaccination for persons under the age. Um, I mean, vaccination for persons from the age of 19 um, was opened in Kenya. And so that meant that more people have access to vaccines. And so when more people, especially the younger population, have access to the vaccines, then it means that, you know, they're able to take care of their health concerns. And this now gives them room to now um, focus on other issues. Um, 
in, in regards to the narratives on young people and COVID, I think, um, Stephen, you had mentioned that in your presentation on what are some of the narratives that we are seeing, which I think I've already mentioned that we're seeing very positive narratives of youth playing a clear, um, a clear role in, in COVID-19 response because, you know, as some have noted, future actions the future depends on their actions today. So if they want to ensure that they're still alive to participate in economic inclusion, to participate in leadership and governance, then the one thing they need to do is secure their health. And at least uh, spaces have opened where vaccines are easily accessible, not just in government facilities, private hospitals, but also within um, you know, community centers. Those are some of the spaces that are being used to, to administer the vaccines. And a lot of youth have come out to ensure that other people, other youth also come and take up this vaccine. So I see um, that's one positive thing. Um, we remain to see, I think what now remains to be seen ongoing is then um, how, how with the number of youth being um, vaccinated or having access to the vaccine, how then will this help them in terms of reducing some of the negative effects that they have felt economically as a result of being excluded um, you know, from the economic space and also as a result of not having um, access to the vaccine as a result of things like curfews being implemented in certain areas, which then reduces the amount of time one has to let's say operate their business. So those are just some of the comments I had to share. I don't know if maybe Stephen Omalos has an additional comment on how on what they think more youth being vaccinated might contribute towards their inclusion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Linda. And uh, I mean, I see we've still got five minutes or so, so left, and uh, we've still got um, a decent amount of attendees with us. Uh, please feel free to raise your hand if you would like to just to, to speak directly or, or add to the Q&A section. Um, I'm not sure if, if Lucy wanted to, to comment on, on Linda's, Linda's question and I guess for Rosita as well is um, yeah, how do we think that young people receiving the, the vaccine, you know, how will this influence their, their inclusion? Um, yeah, I, I guess I have seen and, and I've, you know, I'm blessed uh, to be able to be working. Uh, I'm, I was technically, I'm not a young person anymore, I uh, turned 35 a couple of weeks ago, uh, but I work with young colleagues who are, are in their mid twenties, and you know I, I think the great value of that is they share their first hand experiences and, and and views on the vaccine, and I think you know there's this 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 kind of sense of young people having to to wait until the very end to to receive the vaccine, and and will they receive the vaccine with with uh, twelve year olds or you know young young children and. And and this this I guess even in that narrative of take this vaccine so that one day you can um, you know get the the jobs that you you're looking for, um, yeah I'm not sure how I feel about President Ramaphosa's letter that he wrote. Um, if I'm perfectly honest and and speak from from the gut, um, I think that young people still have a right to to, to be upset to be angry. And that now, now, like this conversation around vaccinations, we brought up, and in a way to, to say that so much rests on you, you know, kind of you guys, the power, the things that rest with you, you know, the future of this COVID pandemic is on your shoulders in a way. It's like, yes, you can be the savior, but at the other time, on the other end of the equation, what happens if young people don't um, take the vaccine in high numbers? You know, will they then be blamed for? the pandemic continuing um, so the sense that now young people are needed only now um, yeah I think some young people might might kind of feel that way and, and feel disgruntled and even though our president is doing a good job I think there, there is still some frustration there. Um, Melissa or Zita would you guys like to to comment? Okay, I must have just checking with the attendees. No one has just raised their hand. So I guess after, after this, we can potentially 
wrap up this this first webinar. Um, um, Steve, yes. maybe I can come in when you're done. You can go for it. Thank you. Um, I, I think I'm in agreement with points that have been raised by um, panelists in terms of uh, the vaccination and that in Zimbabwe, we currently have the, vaccine, the vaccination program ongoing and they've extended the vaccination for 14 to 19 year olds. Um, so yeah, the, the vaccination program is on, has been going on well, um, but I think we may not achieve the targets that the government is said to say by December 2021, we should um, then have had um, we have vaccinated uh, 20, 10 million uh, Zimbabweans. But I think um, you know the response has been some young people are getting vaccinated, some are still skeptical about this vaccination due to misinformation, disinformation. But I think the issue that we need to also work more around is also then to say, how do we also even young people in Zimbabwe trusting more um, this institution? so that there's also even uh, public confidence around these vaccinations. Um, so beyond COVID-19, young people still have other issues that they that do affect them. So I think it's also important that there's public confidence, there's trust in these institutions that are functional. And what is also worrying in here is that uh, we've also had other government institutions also saying if you're not vaccinated you will not participate in these processes we are also seeing other organizations companies also kind of making the vaccine vaccination mandatory though my understanding is that vaccination is, is an individual choice so i'm also foreseeing a situation if you're not vaccinated as, as, as a young person for example you may not uh, be able to access um, certain um, institutions or processes. So for me, it's also then to say in as much as we uh, want to get young people, the citizens get vaccinated, how do we also strike a balance to also ensure that we also respect their individual choices? Um, um, so that's what I wanted to add in terms of um, the fax, uh, the issue of the vaccination in this uh, current context. Thank you. Great, thanks, Rudita. You raised um, many, many great points there, uh, and I appreciate that. And maybe, maybe just in, in closing, we had one question from Pauline, and um, Pauline Odire asked, uh, "What are some of the qualifications in order to get the vaccine?" And I, I guess different countries might be having different approaches. For us in South Africa, from what I understand, is um, you know needed a, an ID, uh, identity document, and um, you know, that is, uh, in South Africa, I had to look it up again to, to be sure, and that's citizens or permanent residents who receive uh, South African IDs. And so I think there has been a lot of debate around that. It does seem uh, that non-nationals in South Africa have been excluded from, um, you know, the vaccination uh, campaign. You know, and I've also heard um, young, young people working in South Africa uh, about returning to Zimbabwe just to be vaccinated, you know, but I, I guess um, I don't know the, the full story or the, or the full truth. Uh, I see Linda is also responding to, to Pauline's question. Um, on my end, uh, unfortunately, I do see our time is up, um, but I just want to thank everyone for, for joining us today.